third lesson in this unit is going to deal with the angles in standard position. And then we're going to look at something called the cast rule. So far this unit we've already discussed uh, a review of the right angled trig. So we've talked about uh, the sine, cosine, and tangent ratios, uh, as well as how to label a diagram using the Pythagorean theorem and angles of elevation and, and uh, depression. Uh, we've also talked about the special angles, the 30, to the 45, and the 60 degree angles, and what their exact values are when it comes to sine, cosine, and tangent. And we've also discussed the reciprocal ratios, or what we call the secondary trig ratios, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a different way to graph angles. Now normally we see angles in triangles, um, but we can also graph angles on an xy plane. So as you can see off to the left here, we have an xy plane uh, already written here. I'll just draw on the x and the y. So we can draw an angle and uh, on the xy plane. We say that an angle is in its standard position if it's located between two different rays. So these little uh, arrow or these lines here that have arrows at one end and a dot at the other end, they're called rays. One of these rays is called the initial arm and one of these rays is called the terminal arm. Essentially the initial arm always stays on the positive side of the x-axis, just like this one right here. The terminal arm can rotate itself around the x-axis. So for instance I have this terminal arm right here, but it's possible this terminal arm can rotate itself around, be a bit lower, it could be a bit higher, it could also rotate itself around this way, even all the way further down here and anywhere around the entire xy plane. So in essence this terminal arm sort of defines how big the angle will be when the angle is located in between those two arms. We always measure an angle starting from the initial arm and then moving all the way to the terminal arm. So it sort of works in a counterclockwise fashion. And when we move counterclockwise from the initial arm going up to the terminal arm, that angle there would be a positive angle. Whereas if I measured it going in a clockwise fashion from the initial arm, so going around this way, we would end up with a negative angle. We're going to discuss that a bit later on in a future lesson. Another way we can describe an angle is to describe it by what quadrant it lies in. So we determine its quadrants based on the fact that our angles are always starting in this top left quadrant of the xy plane. So we call this the first quadrant, and then the quadrants move in counterclockwise fashion. So quadrant 1, then this is quadrant 2 over here, quadrant 3 over here, and quadrant 4 all the way down here. Just like how when we uh, create the angles, they always start on the initial arm right on the x-axis and move counterclockwise. So they move through quadrant 1, and then all the way through quadrant 2, and so on and so forth, until it gets all the way back. It might also be helpful to note how many degrees it takes to get to each of these different bars on our uh, xy plane. So if we start at zero degrees over here, notice how when I move the terminal arm all the way up to this bar, this is 90 degrees. We can recognize that as a right angle right there. If the terminal arm keeps going, we would eventually reach 180 degrees or a straight line we keep on going down here, we eventually get to 270 degrees, and then we can make our way all the way back up to the initial arm, where this would eventually be 360 degrees. And we've heard of uh, rotations being 360 degrees before, if you ever watch snowboarding or, I guess, figure skating when they do jumps, they always talk about how they do a 540 or they do a 720 or even a 10. Uh, what's what's that? 1080, 1080. So however many rotations that is uh, around, that just tells you how many times it goes around. So on this diagram here, this green angle here is 130 degrees. Notice how it's between the 90 and 180, somewhere in between there. Uh, in fact, it's exactly 40 degrees from the 90 and 50 degrees up from the 180. Whereas if we calculated it going the other way around, so clockwise around, it would actually be a negative angle of 230 degrees. So it goes 90 to here, 180 all the way to here, and then an extra 50 degrees this way. Um, but it's negative because we went clockwise.
Uh, this angle would also be called uh, being in quadrant 2 because that's where the terminal arm is. So wherever the terminal arm is, we define that angle as being in that quadrant. So we're going to look at a couple other definitions here. Look at, the, at this diagram on the right. I have the uh, initial arm, the terminal arm drawn there again. And we're going to define a point P. Now this P is going to have coordinates X and Y. We don't know what those letters are yet. But if you look at the, how this point P is lying on the terminal arm, uh, I've also drawn a circle that centers itself around the origin and connects itself with that point P. So it's intersecting with all of these things. If I drew a dotted line down to the initial arm, notice how I have now a right angle triangle that I've created, and my theta happens to be in one of those corners. Uh, a couple of these sides of the triangles we can also define. I know the bottom here is going to be a length of x because my point P is uh, at the coordinate with an, a coordinate x value coordinate of x. The height uh, the height of the triangle is going to be y, because I know that my coordinate there is at y. So I know x and I know y, I just don't know my hypotenuse yet. And so I've defined this as r, and the reason I used r is because it looks like it's the radius of this circle. But how can I find r? Well, I can find r using the Pythagorean theorem. So I've sort of written it down here that we could use uh, the Pythagorean theorem. So taking the square root of both of these sides, I'd get r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. But one of the other things that I've defined here is we can use the trig ratios on this triangle. So with theta being down in this corner in standard position, we know that the sine of angle theta is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Or in this case, the opposite sign is y and the hypotenuse is r. The cos sine of this angle is the adjacent over the hypotenuse or x over r. And a tangent is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, or y over x. So I've defined those three different ratios over here. So let's look at an example of how this could be useful for us. So we're going to have the point 4, 6. And it says here that this point 4, 6 lies on the terminal arm of angle theta. So we're going to want to determine what the three primary trig ratios are associated with this angle. And then we're going to want to find theta. Step one for us is we need to determine where this terminal arm is going to be. So I'm going to plot the point 4, 6 on my graph over here. So let's, uh, let me put the x and y axes here. And the point 4, 6 would be approximately 4 over and 6 up. So let's just assume we have a point right here. We'll call this point P at 4, 6. And now I'm going to draw a terminal arm that goes through there. So let me get a uh, line here. So the terminal arm goes right through that point P. And just like we did up above, we can draw a dotted line that comes from that point all the way down to the x-axis. And this creates a right angle triangle for us, where our theta is in standard position in between the initial arm and the terminal arm. Now, what are some lengths that we can find on this triangle? Well, I know the x value is 4, so the base of this triangle is going to be 4 units long. I know the height is y, or y units up, so I know that's going to be 6 units. The only thing I don't know is uh, this value of the hypotenuse, so we can call that r for right now. Uh, so in order for us to figure out the three primary trig ratios, a couple of those ratios use the length of the hypotenuse. So we can solve for r. And to do that, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. So let's solve for r. So we're going to say r squared is equal to uh, x squared plus y squared. So I always write out the formula first before I use it. And uh, x in this case is 4, so 4 squared. y is 6. So this is equal to r squared. Uh, 4 squared is 16. 6 squared is 36. And 16 plus 36 is equal to 52. And so I have r squared is equal to 52. And when I take the square root of both sides, I get r is equal to root 52. Now normally when I take a square root, I want to use the plus or minus of that square root. but 
uh, realizing that r is a length of a sine of a triangle, I know that the answer has to be positive. There's no way I could have a negative length on a triangle. So r is equal to root 52. Is there any way we can simplify this radical number? Well, uh, think of a perfect square that might divide evenly into 52. I might take a few uh, guesses here, but uh, 52 is actually evenly divisible by 4. So uh, r will equal the square root of 4, and it's 4 times 13 equals 52. And so I end up with the square root of 4 is 2, and then root 13. So 2 root 13. So I'm going to replace that uh, where my r goes right here. I'll just uh, write it right beside it here. This is 2 root 13. So now that I know uh, all three sides of my triangle, I can come up with what the uh, three primary trig ratios are. So what is sine, cosine, and tangent? So let's write those down here. So I know that sine theta is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse side. Well, in our triangle, the opposite side is equal to 6. Remember, our theta is down here, so the opposite is 6. And the hypotenuse side is 2 root 13. I'm going to want to rationalize this denominator, because I don't want a square root in the denominator. But before I do that, I'm going to simplify this 6 and this 2, because I know that both are divisible by 2. So this can actually simplify with the 6, and the 6 turns into a 3. This turns into a 1. I don't need to write that. So to rationalize this, I'm going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the square root of 13. And I'm left with 3 root 13 over 13. And 3 and 13 do not simplify with each other, so it stays as that. Cosine theta, same idea. We just want the adjacent over the hypotenuse, so the adjacent is 4, the hypotenuse is 2 root, root 13. And again, I can simplify this 2 and the 4. And when I rationalize, I multiply both the top and bottom by root 13, so I end up with 2 root 13 all over 13. Tan theta, remember tan is equal to opposite over Adjacent, so the opposite side is 6, the adjacent side is 4. This is much easier to simplify. 6 over 4, well, we know that that is equal to 3 over 2, or 1 and 1 half, 1 1.5. And there you have it. Part B here is we want to figure out what theta is. Well, we can figure out what theta is using either the sine, the cosine, or the tangent ratio. It doesn't matter which one you use, each of them will give you the same answer. So if I were to pick, I'd probably pick the tangent ratio here, only because 3 over 2 seems much easier than uh, 2 root 13 over 13, or even 3 root 13 over 13. So let's get our calculator out here and figure out, if I know tan theta is equal to 3 over 2, uh, what does theta equal? So of course, when I want to solve for theta here, I need to get tan inverse of 3 over 2. So I'll get my calculator out here. There it is. Let's move this over here. So tan inverse uh, of 3 over 2. So second function tan of 3 over 2. And I get 56.3. So I'll write that in here. Our theta is equal to 56.3, approximately. Now this is in degrees. We can double check that we did this correctly. I'm going to try to also find theta using, let's say, cosine. So if I'm going to use cosine here, I know that theta is going to equal the cosine inverse of this uh, whole mess right here, 2 root 13 over 13. And let's see if it equals the exact same thing as tan. So we'll get our calculator back out here. Clear this out. So we're going to find the cosine inverse of 
2 root 13, so 2 and then the square root of 13 divided by 13. And that equals 56.3, the exact same. So we've just proven that uh, we can use a tan, cosine, or uh, I don't have to prove it, but you can prove it yourself if you'd like, or the sine ratio, and each of them will give you the exact same angle. And that should be true because theta can only be one measurement of an angle.